Welcome everybody to the time of hype. I know you thought I was going to say hype activity, but I'm workshopping a new title. So time of hype it is. This month we are going to see how much you know about the CSF staff. Now you may have not met all three of us, but just take your best guess. So I'm going to actually name a fact and you need to guess if it pertains to me, Ethan, our head minister, Andrew, our other associate uh, minister, Alex. So those are your guesses, Ethan, Andrew, or Alex. Um, and here we have Rebecca, a lovely member of the ministry. Um, and she's gonna kind of play along with me. She has not seen this list. Don't think that she's cheated. Um, so if she, if she gets the most right, then technically she will be the winner of the online portion. Um, but basically please keep track of, of how many you've gotten right. Uh, we'll play the honor system. And at the end of this, um, I'll ask everybody how many you've gotten right, and the most who has right gets the prize, which we haven't decided yet, but um, last month it was coffee, so you can guess it's gonna be probably something pretty good. So let's get started here. Number, number one, the fact is, which staff member once literally jumped off a bridge because everybody else was doing it? Andrew. Correct answer is Alex, which makes a lot of sense. Number two, which staff member has three half sisters? Best guess. Alex. Correct answer is me. If you want to know how, I'll tell you. <clears throat> Next fact. Which staff member once ate a taco 12 pack from Taco Bell in one sitting? Um, Andrew. Correct answer is me. I've actually done it a couple times, but. Okay, next one. Which staff member is actually left-handed. Alex. Correct answer is Alex. Nice. You see him play sports, he uses his right, but he actually writes lefty, poor fella. <clears throat> okay, next fact. Which staff member likes to bake in their free time? Who is a good old Betty Crocker? <laughs> Um, Andrew. Correct answer is Andrew. And it's pretty good too. Okay. Of the staff members, whose dad is taller than them? Keep in mind, we are all over 6'1". Um, Ethan. Good guess, but it's actually Andrew. Okay. And Andrew is 6'4", so think about that one. Okay, next fact is, which staff member met the USA women's beach volleyball duo who are going to be in this summer's Olympic Games? Ethan. That is correct. Yes. <laughs> when you have a volleyball fanatic wife, you just meet the weirdest people. All right, next fact is, which staff member still collects basketball cards? Um, Ethan. Sadly, no, it is Andrew. Andrew, he and his son trade packs all the time. Next fact, who is okay with pineapple being on pizza? Alex. It is absolutely Alex. That is an easy, quick one. I'm sorry if you don't know Alex, but that's a quick one. Uh, next fact, whose favorite card game is Skip Bo? Andrew. It is Andrew, big Skip Bo kind of guy. All right, who thinks March Madness is a better time of year than Christmas? Ethan. How dare you? It's actually Alex. What? <laughs> yes, he loves basketball more than, well, okay. 
the coming of our savior. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't gonna say it. Okay, um, next one. Who, I should be the different number, sorry. Who once paid 18 cents for an Under Armour t-shirt in a Las Vegas outlet mall? Um, Alex? That was me. I had a coupon and it worked wonderfully. Okay, a couple more here. Whose secret guilty pleasure song is When I Grow Up by the Pussycat Dolls? Ethan? I just couldn't help but smile. I like the song. It is my <laughs> secret guilty pleasure. Uh, I give it away. All right. Whose grandpa was a farmer? Andrew. It is Andrew. He's an Oklahoma bred boy. You know everybody's farming down there. Last one. Her. Who? <laughs> Whose college that their undergrad was done, so they got their bachelor's degree at, mm -hmm. does not exist anymore? Their college does not exist. Andrew. What? It is actually Alex, RIP Cincinnati Christian. <laughs> and that is it. I actually forgot to keep tally, so do you know how many you got right? No. Nope. <laughs> it's probably less than three, so if you got more than three, please put it in the comments. And if there is a tie, I have a bonus question that you can go ahead and put your answer in the chat and we'll decide a winner from there. So here's the tiebreaker question. It actually applies to two of the three staff members. Okay. So you have to pick the two. Okay. Just in case you did get more right than I thought. I definitely got more than three. <laughs> but <laughs> tiebreaker is, who was their spouse's first kiss? We're all married. Mm -hmm. Which one of us, which one of us two was our spouse's first kiss in life? Alex and Andrew. It was actually Andrew and Ethan. Shout out to our wives. We're sorry we exposed you. You're wonderful and beautiful. We love you. Thanks for playing, everybody. Let's get ready for the message. Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the message part of our night of worship for uh, April. Um, I'm joined, with, uh, joined by two amazing people. Sabine uh, has been a huge blessing uh, to our ministry uh, since she joined a few years ago. And then Michael, same thing. Um, you guys want to introduce yourselves real quick and just let everybody know who you are? All right. Hi, I'm Sabine. Um, I'm a junior majoring in law with a minor in philosophy, and I'm very blessed and happy to be here today. Yeah, um, I'm Michael. Uh, I'm also a junior. I'm a social work major, a psychology minor wanting to go into therapy, specifically kind of the mental health realm of things with adolescents, college age students. So I uh, would love to get into that, but yeah, so happy to be able to be here. Um, CSF always been like a family to me, so I'm excited to see what we get to get into today. Yeah, and I'm Andrew, I'm one of the campus ministers at CSF, and um, we have been studying uh, this series called Makings of a Messiah. That's a compliments of one of our campus ministers, Ethan Whitson. He came up with that name for us. Uh, it's been a great study for us as we've kind of gone through 15 scenes of Jesus's uh, life, uh, which has been so neat to kind of unpack who Jesus was, uh, how he lived, how he treated people. And we're getting into the season of him getting close to his death. And if we're thinking about Holy, Holy Week, we're uh, recording this during Holy Week because this coming uh, Sunday is Easter. And then we're having the night of worship on Monday. Uh, night. Um, so this particular passage we're thinking about is happening on Thursday of Holy Week, which actually we're recording this on Thursday, which is kind of cool <laughs> to think about uh, talking about the Lord's Supper and getting into this passage for today. Um, so that's kind of where we've been this semester. And the whole idea of making the Messiah is that the Messiah wasn't someone that the Jews had been anticipating. Uh, the kind of Messiah Jesus was, he came as a humble servant. He didn't have a home. Uh, he 
was uh, looking out for the poor and the outcasts and the prostitutes and the tax collectors. Everybody that had been uh, left for dead, he was picking up and saying, hey, join my team. Amen. And he made the religious leaders very uncomfortable. And uh, so this scene we're looking at tonight is a, a very, very intimate scene with his disciples where he gets uh, up close and personal, um, even with one of uh, his disciples who's going to betray him. Um, so it's kind of a really, really intense passage, and we're really excited to jump in. And, and what we're going to do is uh, at the top of this message, we're going to let Michael kind of share his experience with communion, both Sabine and Michael our pastor's kids, um, so, and I'm not, uh, even though I am a, a minister myself, uh, I do have minister kids, uh, um, so it's kind of cool to hear their perspective when we're talking about the Lord's Supper, because so many churches do it differently, and that's one of the things that we've talked about uh, before, so Michael, go ahead and share just a little bit about communion, what it's meant to you in the past, and, and what it means to you now, and uh, kind of uh, things that really hit you when we first went through the scripture together. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, so like he said, I'm a pastor's kid. Um, I've been a pastor's kid for probably around 10 years now. Um, and before that, my grandfather was the pastor. So I've been That's involved right. in kind of the ministry for um, my entire life. And it's always been interesting going through kind of communion. Um, growing up, I always knew it as one way. Um, we do it differently than I found out a lot of churches do, where we actually celebrate communion usually once every couple months. Um, whereas I found down here in Indy, most churches do it every Sunday. Um, and so it's a totally kind of different way of doing things. Um, kind of growing up, we were taught that this is a very important, impactful moment. Um, and if you think about it, it's kind of bringing attention to the most influential and impactful event in human history. And that mm -hmm. is Jesus dying on the cross and saving us so that we can live with him in eternity. And so I think we kind of set it up that this is going to be an event that everyone should kind of look forward to, celebrate, kind of like a little mini holiday within the church season. And so whenever we had that day where we came to communion, um, you always had a big number of people there at church. Um, everyone was involved in it. Um, I've Our church growing up has always been pretty large. So there was always a good number of people there and you'd see families breaking up. We'd have lots of different sections. And it was just kind of like, again, like almost a celebration where we take the day and we really just focus on that act that Jesus did for us, that again changed all of, you know, our lives and the lives of humankind. So that's kind of what I grew up, kind of understanding what communion was. And then coming here uh, and coming to Indianapolis churches, um, right now I'm going to Ben Davis Christian Church. Um, I also went to Connection Point for a while. Um, so those two have been the primary churches I've been going to, and they kind of taught a different message, which I think it can be just as influential. And I've really come to uh, like appreciate just the importance of recognizing, again, this act that changed all of our lives should not be something that necessarily is, you know, put off, but we should consistently be celebrating it. Because again, that's kind of the, the emphasis that I kind of understood too. Um, and so that's kind of the thing that I've really come to enjoy when we do it every week. It's not more of like this, you know, celebration, but it's, or it is a celebration, but it's not like, you know, a specific day that we can take aside to celebrate, but it's a consistent reminder of what Jesus did for us. And, you know, that's been super cool as well, just to be able to kind of every single week really take time and think about that act of selflessness that Jesus did for us. And I think for me, it's just been a really cool kind of transition to kind of differing belief systems, but at the end of the day, both have really powerful messages behind them. And I think getting to where I'm at today, um, it's just been really awesome to kind of where I'm at with Ben Davis. Actually, every single week I look forward to spending that time and really thinking about that act. And it just reminds me and um, humbles me to know that we serve a God that, again, died for us and did everything, paid the ultimate price so that we could be with him. And so um, it's been a really interesting transition. But again, there's great things to both sides. And I really learned a lot, I think, through the entire process. So it's been it's been a great kind of investigation, especially now with what we've been doing with specifically this this past passage. Yeah, and I think, too, like just to kind of move off of what you just said, um, we're very forgetful people. <laughs> we forget our keys and we don't know where our phone is. We forget passwords. And so we have apps that remind us of our passwords and uh, we just have all these systems in place to remind us of um, where stuff is and 
<laughs> and uh, maybe our social security numbers too or whatever. And uh, you got to view communion as that built-in reminder to remind us not only of what Jesus did for us on the cross, but also to remind us of who we are. You know, we need that constant reminder of who, who Jesus says that we are. And so if you have ever had a bad memory, which I think most of us have, or you have ever wondered who you are and whether or not life's worth living, and I think we've all had those low moments in our lives, uh, then I think this scripture that we're about to read together is specifically designed for you and for all of us who have struggled with hope on a daily basis, because that's ultimately what this scripture is about. It's about bringing hope and purpose and meaning to each and every day that we live. So uh, we're going to hear from Sabine as well later on in the message. So let, let's go ahead and jump into the scripture. Um, we're going to be in Matthew uh, chapter 26. Um, in our life group material for this, there's like uh, many uh, accounts of the Lord's Supper that you're going to study uh, this coming week uh, in your life groups. We're just going to grab one because uh, we, we don't want the sermon to be two and a half hours. Um, but uh, so we're going to read, uh, Sabine's going to read uh, Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 through 25 is the first part of our scripture that we're going to look at uh, today. All right. The Passover with the disciples. Now on the first day of the unleavened leavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the 12. And as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to one another, to him, one another, is it I, Lord? He answered, he who has dipped his hand into, in the dish with me will betray me. The son of man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, you have said so. Amen. I think you're muted. <laughs> so, wow. So one of the things that we uh, pointed out when we were reading through this again for like the second time or just a little bit ago as we were preparing for this time was that this first section is longer than the actual script of Jesus taking the bread and taking the cup. And that's almost bizarre to us that there was so much time uh, that was given to understanding the context of what the Lord's Supper was set in, and then also uh, who it was that was going to betray Jesus uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so I think that those two things are pretty vital to understanding the scripture and having a good background. So when Jesus takes the bread, and he breaks it, and he takes the cup, and he, he gives it to the disciples, uh, it's pretty meaningful, not pretty meaningful, it's very meaningful. And so the Passover, you know, the Jews had three main Jewish festivals um, that they observed each, each year that were like top. Um, one of them was Passover, and Passover was probably the most important one that they had, and it reminded them of the time when um, the, the, you know, the death angel came through the camp uh, during one of the play, the last plague, and they put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost uh, to protect them from the death death angel, and it reminded them also uh, that was the blood, and then the bread represented like this unleavened bread that they had to get out of Egypt quickly and didn't have time to have the leaven raise the bread. They had to make haste out of Egypt and didn't have time for the leaven uh, to make the bread rise, and so that was kind of the significance behind the Passover. And just to give you a little more timeline. That Jesus is crucified uh, right before Passover begins, and then the church is going to launch at the next Jewish festival, which is the, the day of Pentecost, uh, the, uh, the Feast of Weeks. And so that's going to be coming. That's 50 days. So we're not talking about, you know, talking about timing and when the Lord's Supper was and when Jesus died on the cross. On, uh, you know, Lord's Supper's on Thursday. He died on the cross on Friday, rose from the dead on Sunday. Then, uh, you know, 50 days later, 
we have the beginning of the church in, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So that's really, really good to remember as we're reading through the scripture. And then the second thing is uh, Judas. Judas Iscariot. A lot of emphasis is put on him here, like betraying Jesus. And we were trying to kind of understand exactly why there's such a big emphasis put on Judas's betrayal. Judas and, and Pharaoh, I think, are the two that really bother me in scripture uh, to where their lives were used by God, but not in a positive way. I mean, Judas is used uh, in his life because of choices that he made uh, to be the betrayer. Uh, even before he betrayed Jesus, you know, he was stealing uh, from the uh, money bag that they had that provided for their needs in the ministry. And so uh, for a long time, uh, Judas really struggled making good decisions. And um, he ultimately made a, the worst decision you could make, which is betraying the son of God, um, which is really, really intense. Um, so one of the things Michael was mentioning was that, uh, you know, Judas betraying Jesus should be a wake-up call for us. And with our deeds and our decisions, we have, in a way, betrayed Jesus. We have made poor decisions. And um, because of those, those decisions, those sins that we've committed, that's why Jesus had to go to the cross for all of our sin. And um, not only that, but what am I capable of doing? Uh, I am capable of some pretty dark things if I don't let Jesus be the Lord of my life. So that's that first section. So, My Michael, you want to read the next uh, set of verses, uh, verses 26 through 29. Yeah, definitely. So the institution of the Lord's Supper. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing, it broke and he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So since we know the, the background of the Passover, this just makes it so, so cool, right? We get into, uh, Sabine was mentioning, the her and her mom, even this morning, were reading through the passage in the Gospel of John where Jesus uh, you, was having this giant following, and all of a sudden he's talking about eating uh, his flesh and drinking his blood, and everybody's like, I'm out. Uh, I don't want anything to do with this, this uh, strange teaching. Um, but we come down to it, and Jesus took the bread, and he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. This is the same um, type of rhythm that he used when he fed the 5,000. He took it, he blessed it, uh, he broke it, and he gave it. And uh, a lot of people have kind of made that connection with what he does with us, right? So he takes us, he blesses us, and uh, he breaks us, and he gives us. Uh, I think that that's pretty powerful to think about but the bread represents his body that was broken. Uh, the unleavened bread re represents the haste in which he brought us out of our condemnation, out of our shame, out of our darkness, out of our death, and brought us into life. And the blood represents, or, the, or the, the juice, uh, the wine represents his blood that was shed uh, for the forgiveness of many, and driving out all that darkness so that we could be saved. And um, I just think that this is just big time. Uh, it's poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Uh, we would like to think that after a, enough time of trying to get our lives together, that we're going to do a, a good enough job to, to be good enough to be in God's presence, but it's just not going to happen. We've had thousands of years of case studies where <laughs> human beings have tried and tried and tried and tried and tried to be good enough and has not worked. And there's no reason to believe it's going to work today or tomorrow either, uh, because we need Jesus. We need his forgiveness. We need his body. We need his blood. We need that reminder. And so coming out of that and then looking into that scripture, Samin, just go ahead and share a little bit about, Michael shared a little of his background with what, uh, how his experience with communion. Uh, go ahead and share just a little bit about um, what communion meant for you. And when you first took communion, that's kind of a cool story for all of us to hear. 
Amen. Well, um, like Pastor Andrew said, I am a pastor. I'm a kids. I'm a child of pastors. If I can speak English, um, I'm from Congo, uh, which is in Africa, and so in our culture, usually young kids don't take Passover or take um the breaking of the bread or the drinking of the wine or juice at that, you know, but because of the, not just be, not because we don't allow them to, but because our parents always teach us that there's a deep spiritual level of when you take this, when you take the bread of, which is the body and the blood of Jesus. So growing up, um, I didn't take the Passover or not the Passover. I didn't take the stuff. I'm calling Passover. I didn't take the breaking of the bread or anything like that until um, I believe 2015 when I was baptized. Um, so what our church did was we decided that we would make a promise with God that we would give him the last seven days of every year. So from um, so we don't get to eat any Christmas dinner or anything, but you know it's a sacrifice before the Lord. So the last seven days we go to church and we fast dry. Um, and then before the new year or during the new year, into the new year, we take the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the blood of the Lord. And the first time I took that, like I said, was in 2015. And during that time, um, it really hit me, not just the physical aspect of taking it, but the spiritual aspect of taking it. Like Pastor Andrew said, we've all been to that point where we feel like nothing's going on, like life is just, what's the point of living it? And um, like we previously discussed with him and with Michael, it's also a problem of identity, of knowing who you belong to. And, you know, as the Bible says in verse 28, for this is my blood given of the covenant, which is the new covenant, you know, where it's no longer by our strength or it is no longer by sacrificing, you know, goats or sheep or whatever, but it is by grace that we have been saved. And so when we spiritually remember this and when we take this, when we take the bread and the wine and we remember this and we see this in a spiritual level, um, for me at least, it reminds me that no matter what I could do, there's nothing that could take me away from the grace of God. No matter mm. how hard I may feel like I'm nothing or I fail or I mess up, I fail a test, I make, you know, I sin or I fall, there's nothing. His blood is still there. His blood is always there, ready to forgive me. And his body is always there as a sacrifice. And it teaches me how to be a living sacrifice, as Roman 12 tells us. It teaches me to take my cross and to walk. You know what I mean? It doesn't, the Lord never said it would be easy, but he said he'd be with us, you mm -hmm. know, and that's my, that's what makes my heart at peace, you know, and when I, every time I take this, we usually take it, I think at our church, you know, twice or three times a year. Um, but of course, often for me, that's a blessing as well. Whenever I go back to Indiana and I go with my sister to church, we take it when we go there. And what I, I don't think it matters how much you take it, but I think it matters in what mentality you're taking it in. Um, recognizing that I'm not just drinking juice from the store. No, this is the blood of Jesus. This is the body that he gave. I am a disciple of Christ and he is breaking it for me on the cross that he continues to break it for me every day and he would do it all over again. And for me, when I recognized and when I really understood that, that's when the Lord began to really transform my life to be like, wow, this is what it means to be a disciple of Christ. This is what it means to be a Christian. And to understand that it's not just what it means, but what, what is awaiting me, you know, in all of this grace that I will be resurrected one day. And I am resurrected as I am now, every single time I take this bread and I drink this blood, but mm. yeah. Amen. So good. And one of the things that we were really kind of hit us when we were going through this uh, earlier was just a few things is that when I was a kid and I was taking communion, <laughs> took communion, I was baptized when I was 10. I were to take communion for the first time. And, you know, as a 10 year old uh, versus being a 39 year old that I am now, the, the differences between me taking communion are very different, but it was in a way it was the same, you know, I think, um, I, I was always, as a kid, I was thinking, this is such an ordinary thing. Like, um, it wasn't mystical for me. It wasn't like um, that this is, uh, you know, the, the skies are parting and I'm seeing the world through like these, uh, you know, everything's shiny or whatever. But it, was, it wasn't mystical, but it was ordinary. Yet, at the same time, even though it was ordinary, ordinary people serving ordinary elements of stale like bread and lukewarm juice, uh, you know, nothing fancy about it. Um, but at the same time, 
it was relevant and met me where I was and it was powerful giving me what I needed. And I think uh, so many times we think, well, this has to be, this, my experience has to be, uh, you know, sensational. And uh, I've got to have, you know, this experience that's otherworldly that everybody's going to be like, oh, that's so amazing what God did in your life. Well, communion kind of, its elements are ordinary, mm -hmm. but it, like for Jesus, it was the Passover meal. Everything he needed for the Lord's Supper was already at the table when they were celebrating Passover. And he took what he had in front of him that was ordinary and he made it into an extraordinary focus Amen. and an event for them. And so I just think that that's really important for us to remember as we think about communion, as we think about what Jesus did for us. Um, I, I had an older gentleman at our, our church that uh, I used to be a minister at, and he came up to me one time and he said, Andrew, communion is my very favorite part of the service. And I was thinking, why would you say that? We've been working all week and all this music and, and the pastor has been put in like 20, 30 hours working on this sermon and we got all this sound and lighting and, and we got the temperature in this room just right. And, and he was like, no, it's that ordinary bread, that ordinary juice in which God does something extraordinary in my life. Yeah. Come on. I mean, yeah. I that really made a difference in my life when I was able to hear somebody who was in their 80s who had taken communion hundreds of times, and yet it was still his favorite part of the service. Um, I think I've shared the story before, but last year I was preaching at a, one of our churches that we partner with, and, um, and uh, there, when I was preaching, this lady uh, in the audience, you could just tell she was just jiving with it like yeah you know like nodding and like older lady and uh, after the service I caught her I said man thank you ma'am thank you so much for being so responsive during the message uh today and she was like oh no problem it's no problem for me to get excited about the gospel she's like I still remember what God saved me from mm. and that really hit me I was thinking okay so here I am, humdrum, going to church again, experience the same things, maybe singing the same songs, taking the same communion, seeing the same people. And here, here this woman is, is saying, I still remember what God saved me from. And I think that's what communion is. Mm -hmm. It's remembering what God saved me from. Mm -hmm. And if I can remember what God saved me from, I can remember who I am. I'm not a performer. I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not supposed to be perfect. I don't have to have my whole life together. I don't have to have all the answers, mm -hmm. but I do have to know that I'm a child of God and I'm loved by God. And um, one of the things we were mentioning earlier before we started recording was that um, we need to know who we are anyway, right? We need to know that we're children of God, that God loves us. And he sent his son to die for us. Um, but I think we especially need to know who we are for when things don't work out how they're supposed to work out. You didn't get the internship. You didn't get the job. You didn't get into this school you want to get into. You didn't, uh, you didn't get the grade you were wanting to get. You didn't get to date the person you wanted to date. Whatever, fill in the blank. I mean, disappointment is around the corner. We live in a fallen world. And if we don't know who we are, uh, there is no hope in living for tomorrow. Uh, but if we know who we are, and we know that Jesus loves us, we know we can face anything that comes our way. Not because we're so powerful and so great and so smart, but because of who Jesus is. And um, that's a really good segue into the end here, where we just give you, everybody, an opportunity uh, to respond to the gospel and to uh, say, I want to make Jesus my Lord and my Savior. So, man, if you're interested in making that decision, we've got a great page on our website, csfiupy.com slash baptism. Uh, on that page, it's not just about baptism, it's about belief, repentance, confession. Um, what does it mean to be a Christian? And uh, 
please check, check that page out and send us a direct message. We'd love to connect with you. Um, but I do appreciate Sabine and Michael, thank you for joining us and, and sharing your heart. Any last words you guys have about communion or anything you want to encourage everybody about as we, we end our time together? Yeah, I would just close in saying um, for a lot of us who where communion might not be as new and it's kind of, you know, we can get into the habit of it being mundane and weekly even. I would just really encourage everyone to just really take time during each and every one of those events and just ponder and think about the sacrifice that God gave for us. Really think about the act that we are celebrating. And like Sabine said, there's so many different things that we can take out of communion. Um, I think it kind of reminds me of like reading the Bible. You can read the same verse over and over mm. and over again, depending what you are going through, it can hit you in a totally different way. So I just want to encourage everybody to not just think about, you know, communion and be like, oh, it's another part of church. Cause I can definitely relate to that being that, uh, you know, going weekly, it, it's become that, but to really just be like, you know what, I'm going to be seeing how this is going to impact me um, and really just take time, take this seriously and contemplate everything that we've kind of just discussed here tonight. So um, it's a really important and amazing event if you really let it. Amen. Amen to that. I would just um, encourage, like Michael said, to really, above all, ask the Lord to teach you what communion is. Ask him what he meant, you know, when he was saying I'm breaking the bread. Because above all, you know, everyone can share with you, but when the Lord tells you and reveals it to you, it's something that sticks with you 80 years later, you know? Right. Um, so ask the Lord to reveal to you, what do you mean on communion? What do you want me to understand through this communion? Mm -hmm. And like Michael said, you know, to take time and to really, really don't let it be, don't, don't, you know, it can be something that's every week, but let it be impactful every week, you know, let it be every moment, let you look forward to, let me be reminded of the blood of Jesus and his grace over my life. But yeah, I hope everyone has a great Easter resurrection day. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and I think too, we need that reminder of who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to know that we're loved. Jesus loved us so much that he went to the cross. Amen. He was going to spare nothing, even his own mm -hmm. life so that we could be in heaven with him. Um, I've been thinking about John 3.16 this entire time we were talking. I mean, it's so basic and so simple to what we've learned as kids. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so that is the core of the gospel that Jesus came because he loved us. Uh, let's close in a word of prayer and we'll be done. God, thank you so much uh, for this time where we can focus on uh, the body and the blood of our Savior. Thank you, God, for loving us enough to send your son to die on the cross for our sins, all of our darkness, to drive it out, to draw us closer to yourself so that we can be in heaven someday and live, live a brand new life right now. God, thank you for Sabine. We thank you for Michael sharing their hearts. I pray that it would have connected with some students uh, and that they would uh, have a better understanding, a better, a richer understanding of communion and what it means to interact uh, with the sacrifice of our Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Bye, y'all. Yeah.